Hiya, and welcome back to One Last Night. The game that teaches us that our precious Bunker Bat Boy must be protected at all costs. And if he isn't, I'll know. Anyways, let's just hop right in. Xavier was weaponless. <laughs> Dear Marshall, I'm scared. We're about to reach two years together. A milestone for any couple. It's something I should be ecstatic for. Knowing we've been together so long feels like both an impossibility and a blessing. Having you love me every step of the way. Which is why I'm even more scared. This is how long things lasted when I was still with Alistair. That name still angers me. I thought things were going well then too, but I was blindsided. I don't want the same thing to happen to you. I believe in your feelings and I trust you to communicate with me. I do. But there's a nagging sensation at the back of my mind that says I don't deserve you. That you'll abandon me like he did. It's made me think a lot about myself, honestly. Let me adjust my microphone so it's more in my face. Why is... The cable was stuck to my foot. I'm scared I'm scared of you leaving me just as I was when I was with him at the start. I've had various friends come and go in my life, which has only fueled that fear. Even my parents are gone now. I've been surrounded by people, but have never forged connections for long. I have you and very few friends I could truly call close. In truth, that's all I could ever want, really. Yet I'm scared of how long they'll all last. Everyone before has left me, so why would now be any different? What's changed to make them stay? It's the thoughts like these that bother me. That haunt me on days like today when that voice gets too loud. I understand some people have to leave, whether by choice or by forces out of their control. I know none of them are trying to abandon me, which is not what I'm scared of. Since we've been together, it's shown me that I can grow and move on. That I can be who I was while being someone new. I can change. So after thinking through it again, and again, and again, I know what I'm afraid of. I know what keeps me up at night, stressing me out as you dream peacefully beside me. I'm scared to be alone. I'm scared of having nobody with me. Nobody I can share a true connection with. I'm like, I am never going to be happy with my microphone placement, ever. I'm scared of not having you with me, Marshall. There's never been anybody who I've gotten close to as I have with you. I'll do my best to quiet these fears for now. To look forward to what our lives together have in store. That's what I'm going to focus on. Just please, Marshall, though you'll never read this, promise me one thing. Never leave me alone. Love, Dorian. No. The word escaped my lips in a hushed tone, drowned out by the sound of the crowd. At that moment, all I could hear was my own thoughts. There had to be something I could do to stop this. To get Xavier out of this fight. He'd practiced fencing with a stick once. Once! That was nowhere near enough experience, despite how fast of a learner he was. I still struggled in my fight, and there was no telling what fated he'd be pitted against. The anxiety began to build in my chest, drawing from the fear that always lingered there. I can't lose Xavier right now. I just can't. Let me just... Hang on, I'm like trying to crack my back right now. Damn it, I can't crack my back. No, I won't. If this is meant to be my story, then I sure as hell am not letting this chapter end this end this and it end this soon. I stopped my retreat to the locker room. Hiya. Turning back to face Alistair as a last ditch idea rooted itself in my mind. Hi, bitch. His eyes met mine instantly, as if you were waiting for this. He raised a hand to quiet the crowd. I'll do it. He blinked, the words momentarily catching him off guard. You'll do what exactly? I'll take Xavier's place. An uneasy silence fell over the arena as, it, as its observers began processing what I just announced. They'd seen my last fight, see how, see how, how battered I, I'd been. I was a bleeding and... 
buckle up. Uh, building off of what Lug said, you better buckle up, you goddamn faded. I'll eat you. I will turn you into a chicken nugget. And feed you to a stray cat. Not Alistair, though. That guy's a that guy's a dick. I was a bleeding and bruised mess standing before them all, asking to fight for their amusement once more. Oh shit, I need to like click on that. It was pathetic. As if on cue with that thought, the whole crowd burst into laughter at my suggestion. Not a single one of them was taking me seriously. They didn't matter right now, however. The only one I needed to convince was Alistair. Isn't this why you want what you wanted Wonderland to be? A show full of drama and suspense as the people at your mercy fight for their lives? Wouldn't you drive more entertainment from watching me get further injuries for the sake of someone close to me? The crowd began to quiet once more as I finished my statement, hoping to appeal to the lion who hated me. It was a desperate gambit for sure, but I refused to lose someone I'd bonded with so fast. The last person that happened with... was Marshall. I shook the thought from my head, pulling myself back to the present. These were things I could get over later when I wasn't trying to save someone's life. Alistair seemed to be pondering my query, using this moment to draw all attention to himself once more. It's a good argument, I'll give you that. A man desperately pleading to spare his lover's life to, to sacrifice his own, especially when said man has wronged me in the past. Wronged you? Oh, hell no. Oh, hell no. Hang on. Oh, hell fucking no. Mm-mm. Mm -mm. First off, first off, first off, you motherfucker trying to look like fucking Simba from The Lion King. You goddamn... Uh... You goddamn Mufasa wannabe looking ass. Um... You over here just trying to be all like... Oh, woe is me. My ex wronged me. No, he fucking didn't. You wronged him, you bitch. I bit my tongue to keep from retaliating. Clearly in his eyes, I was the villain. But... I fell to my knees instantly as a blunt object collided with the back of my head, sending stars throughout my vision. I'd been so focused on Alistair I'd forgotten about the guards. That's not how things work here. Look at yourself! You are barely able to stand as is, and there's definitely no hope of that now. The lion chuckled, clearly amused over the fact that he was responsible for my condition. The guards lifted me by the arms, beginning to drag me across the arena as I tried to get a grip on my bodily functions. You believe yourself to be all that, some hero for the ages who puts others first. You think as though you're the protagonist of some story. But to let me first to break it to you, Dorian. You're pathetic. Try as you might, you exist as nothing but a burden to those around you. You drag everyone down, if it means you can rise to the top and be better. It doesn't matter who you step on if it makes you look like you're in the right. Everyone but you can see that. Look at the man who... Yeah, there were stream issues. Oh, God damn it. God damn it. Welp, stream started over. See, nothing there. Okay. Now nah, we're having network issues over here. Don't know why. It doesn't matter who you step on if it makes you look like you're in the right. Everyone but you can see that. Look at the man who tried to defend you, Xavier. See him for what he truly is. He couldn't even believe in you to do this fight on your own. He seeks control and nothing less. 
Anger started to bubble up as I listened to his words, my senses beginning to recover from the blow as he continued his monologue. I'll say this once more, Dorian, so listen well. You are not the protagonist. Grow up and realize that, especially right now. More importantly, know when and where your place is. You had your time in the spotlight, but right now, this is my show, and what I say goes. I'm going to check something, make sure the stream info is still working correctly. Hell yeah, it's working correctly. Woohoo! We're going to wait for the ad to play. But while that plays, the fucking audacity of this bitch. The audacity. Motherfucker, I ought to go up there and punch you in your little lion nose. I'm gonna, I'm gonna punch you directly into your left nostril. You will be so sad because you got punched in your left nostril that you'll be glaring at me using your left eyeball. Because I will have already removed your right eyeball. We'd finally reached the locker room again. The guards wasted no time in throwing my body through the door into the ground. I hit it hard, panting as the aches in my body washed over me. And I say, we give our next competitor the chance to show he's more than his companion believes he is. Once more, everyone, give a round of applause for the lovely Xavier. I laid there as the crowd outside roared in approval over the speech. Alistair no doubt reveling in the gratification. Other than the physical effects of what had just happened, I felt the mental ones hitting hard at my own insecurities. Despite it being years since we last spoke, I trusted him with all my fears and worries and he clearly hadn't forgotten them since. Maybe he'd even plan to use them against me like this one day. I've always worried about being the one that people have to lag behind for, that they're waiting for me to catch up to their pace. I've never been the best at anything despite how I've tried. I focused and improved some skills, but I couldn't help but think I'd never be worth it. Even now, I knew what I'd done was idiotic. While my heart was in the right place, Alistair was right. I hadn't shown Xavier any faith in his abilities. I should know from my experiences with him this past week that no matter what, the bat isn't a quitter. He has the spirits to keep going. I don't know what motivates him the most, but I know that I can trust him. He can do this. The sound of footsteps approaching drew me back into my painted into my pained body. The aches of the wounds and blunt trauma starting to settle in were a harsh reminder of reality. Out of the fucking way! Do none of you have any decency anymore? Hi. The familiar figures of Shen and Treat approached me, shoving aside the other prisoners who'd made no attempts to help me whatsoever. They crouched to either side of me, helping me back to my feet. Hi, Shen. Hi, Treat. Hey, man, you still with us? Think you can stand? Yes and yes, I should be able to. The moment they let go, I stumbled with my first step. If you're fine, if you're fine, then I'm straight. Treat, get his other arm. The Wolverine shot them a glare, but obliged, the two of them propping me up as we walked towards the exit at the back. I wanted to protest, to stay and watch Xavier's fight to cheer him on, but I knew that he'd put my health over that. I needed to rest and believed he'd be okay. I wouldn't lose him, too. Everyone just watched as we passed, trying to avoid catching the fire of the ignited. And should they help us, really goes to show how people are inherently selfish by nature. Very few people are willing to stick their neck out just to help someone in need. It sickened me. The guards standing at the exit door didn't budge as we approached, glaring at us with disinterest. There's no exit until Wonderland is over for the day. We know that, but our friend here is injured after his fight. He needs to be taken to the nurse and treated. The second bandit rolled his eyes before giving me a once-over. 
I don't see anything life-threatening. He should be fine to stay. I could hear the growl in Treat's vo throat as he responded as calmly as he could. One of your colleagues just bludgeoned the back of his head, likely giving him a concussion. He needs a proper place to rest. Sounds like what he needs is to walk it off. Nobody's leaving this room, understand? Besides, the last thing we do is listen to someone like yourself. Get lost! Treat's muzzle drew back in a snarl, looking as though he was ready to tear them apart before he felt a small shake behind my neck. Shen drew their companion's attention back to them, bringing Treat back out of the anger to take a deep breath. The collected look returned to his face as he made eye contact with Shen. May I? Treat smiled. Go right ahead. Shen took their arm off my shoulder and slipped away, taking a step forward towards the guards. They put on that smile from earlier and looked the second bandit in the eyes. I'll say this once. So hopefully, you two morons can understand. Let us take him to the nurse, or else. The bandits sneered at the hyena. Or else what? What's a slut like you going to do? Shen's grin widened. This. Before any of us could... Before any of us could process what happened, Shen's fist connected hard with the nose of the bandit. The force combined with the surprise of it sent him stumbling back to the wall as he crumpled instantly and cried out in pain. Oh, fuck me! I already have. Didn't know someone was capable of finishing that fast. I'd say it was flattering if it wasn't so pitiful. <laughs> Aggression in that. The other guard quickly recovered from the sudden shock and raised his club to attack the hyena. Shen was already on them, though. The guard doubled over as the hyena slammed their fist into his gut, bringing down an elbow above to send him to the ground in a heap. Once out of breath and the other clutching a likely broken nose, Shen crouched and then grabbed them by the head fur. Now this is a sight that I'm more familiar with. Two assholes getting what's coming to them. They smashed the two together... <laughs> smashed the heads of the two together before standing up and brushing off their heads as the guards groaned in pain. Look at that! You're even moaning, too. <laughs> Mashed patooties! The writer for this game! Can Shen join our team? Can we have a little Final Fantasy? <laughs> Can we have a little Final Fantasy thing that just adds Shen to the team? They're just like do 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 Wait, no, I don't think it's that. Hang on, what's the uh welcome to the team? Oh shit! Hang on, hang on. I I have to. I have to. Can can we just like have like a like a thing? Where we just have like a. Like just a. <laughs> Shen has joined the party. <laughs> The other guards had begun to make their way towards us to get to Shen, but they raised their hands in defense. Sorry, sorry, all good now. We'll go back to being good little captives. Oh shit, it might actually be copyright. Shit. I did not think that through. I did not think that through. Shen backed away and gestured for us to follow, Treat turning to help me along. While I was surprised by Shen's sudden aggressiveness, I was more surprised by the fact the guards had listened to them and left us alone. Looking back, I could, even f I could even see a few laughing at the crumpled bandits. Maybe it wasn't that bad of a strategy to sleep with the enemy. Is Shen a bard? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did not think that through. I did not think that through. 
Looking back, I could even see a few laughing at the crumpled bandits. Maybe it wasn't that bad of a strategy to sleep with the enemy. Treed and Shen exchanged a look as they helped me to a bench far from the door to sit. Smiles on both their faces. I couldn't help but find myself joining in. Those smiles soon erupted into laughter for a few moments. All of us reveling in what had just happened and the absurdity of it. Seeing you beat their asses will never get old to me. Me neither. In more ways than one. Treat turned to me in an effort to move the conversation elsewhere. First things first, let me examine your injuries, Dorian. You can probably answer some questions we have to in the process. Only if I get to ask some of my own. Deal. Alright, I'm looking in the Discord. Looking in the Discord, I don't I don't get notifications for Discord. Um Uh you're not wrong. Amethyst, you're you're not wrong. Thanks for calling me out. Thanks for calling me out, deal. And make it fast, I need to see Xavier's fight. He deserves at least one comforting face in the sea of enemies. Let's get to it then. Wolverine started his inspection from the back of my head, checking the trauma there first. I'll cut to the thing I'm most curious about. You have a pass with that freak of a ringmaster? He stated he knew you. That would be because he does, and we do. How? That's my ex-boyfriend. Treat's fingers pressed a little too hard on a bruise I, as I said that, causing me to wince. Sorry, but also... Repeat that! You dated him! Shit! His head trauma might be worse than we thought if he's this delusional. I glared at the hyena. Believe me, nobody regrets the decision more than me. I wasted two of my two years of my life on his bullshit. Shen whistled in amazement. Are you colorblind then, or is red just your favorite color of flag? I sighed, trying not to move too much so Treat could finish his inspection faster. He wasn't different back then, nothing like he is now. Or you were just so blinded by your own feelings you didn't want to believe you were seeing his true self as things progressed. I assume that's why you ended things. Not exactly. Then what happened? A loud roar from the crowd outside caught my attention, taking me out of the conversation and back to what was happening in the meanwhile. I'll tell you more when Xavier is back. Is your expression done now so we can cheer him on, Doctor? You're not in great condition and should be resting, but your wounds have stopped bleeding for the moment. As long as you don't move too roughly, you'll be fine. Then let's go. With Treat's help, I stood up and carefully began making my way over to the windows. Wait, are you actually a doctor or even one in training? Nope. I was in school for biochemistry. I ended up taking a class on the anatomies of anthro species to help my studies. Where'd you study? I had a scholarship over at Gallhaven due to my rugby skills. I'd been right in my earlier assumption that he'd attended there then. I wanted to ask him more, but that could wait until after Xavier's fight. As some of the prisoners approach saw us approach the windows, they stepped out of the way. They'd likely seen our earlier confrontation and wanted to steer clear of us. Given that there was only one person on the field as the door to it opened and the weapon rack was brought in, it wasn't hard to find Xavier there. The bat was standing with the sword in his hands, both tightly gripping the handle. I had expected to find fear on his face, worry of what was to come. Instead, his expression was full of anger. I'd seen glimpses of it before, when we'd met the silence and were captured, but it was nothing compared to the fury that resided there now. Alistair was already drawing a note from the bowl, about to call out the crate number of which faded that Xavier would fight was hidden against. DOOR NUMBER SEVEN! Just like when it was my turn, the crate above opened the door using ropes to allow the monster inside to escape and wreak havoc. We all waited with bated breath to see what would exit those doors. Breathe, Xavier. You can handle this. I tried my hardest to keep my heartbeat steady as I anxiously waited whatever monster was coming for me. Without a bow, I was without a bow, I was already at a disadvantage. Add to that my broken finger and it dropped my chances of winning even more lower. This whole tournament was about chance, really. It was luck of the draw which faded would come my way and I had to be prepared. I tightened my grip on the longsword I'd chosen to fight with, the daylight gleaming off the well-kept blade. It was my best choice. I'd handled a few to test them out, finding they were surprisingly light. They must have only weighed a few pounds each. I had enough arm muscle to use it due to the lightness, and although the fencing lesson with Dorian was all I had to work with, it was a better base knowledge for me to use comparatively. 
With this sword, I could either use it one-handed, or the more comfortable option for me, two-handed. I'll leave the former to desperate situations. Oh, I wish I had a shield. <gasps> Hi, Xavier, Bunker Bat Boy. A sudden thud from the door startled me as sand begin began to fly up from the arena floor, heading to my left rather than directly towards me. It was hard to tell how large the creature was, likely due to the fact that it had curled into a ball. I guess about the size of the, av of the average humanoid, maybe a little wider. What made it even harder to determine was that it was rolling. It reminded me almost of a pill bug like I'd find when playing in the garden as a kid, except this was much scarier in comparison. Oh my god, thank you for the follow! Thank you for the follow! It's much scarier in comparison. Oh mama! The faded was a blur of pale flesh as it circled me, stirring up sand as it moved to partially obscure my vision. The large, shitinous scales that made up its exterior were a matte white and gray, roughly enough though as to not shine. Rough enough. Ah. I stood firm in the center, watching it keep moving in circles. When and how it was planning to attack... I swear to God, if something happens to Xavier, I will cry. I will start crying. He is a bunker bat boy, and he is precious, and if anything happens to him, I will stab Alistair even harder than I'm already going to. I, I can't say anything. But I am convinced that uh a lot of the platforms that i'm the platforms that i'm on are run by christian puritans and uh they don't exactly take kindly to this content and yet they're letting me create this content i guess so uh yeah the fate had suddenly stopped and charged straight for me turning much faster than i would have expected i raised my sword in preparation to parry an attack at the last moment, the creature flung itself from the ground and into the air. I brought my blade up in an attempt to block the blow. The realization that it was using its entire body as weapon was becoming painfully obvious, only for it to seemingly miss me entirely. The creature landed behind me with a thud and bounced, checking into me as I was turning to deflect. I stumbled forward in pain, the sheer blunt force of the attack nearly knocking me over. My shoulder ached from the blow, meaning it would be even harder to parry an attack. A dodge was a bet was the better option to win. A small sense of pride at my battle tactics surged in my chest. I was beginning to sound experienced when in reality a few fantasy novels could do wonders in strategy. He read Harry Potter. Now wasn't the time for that though. I could see preparing to make its next strike. I'd have to try and hit it with my blade next. I knew how it preferred to attack now, and I needed to check if my sword could penetrate the shield the shell next. Meaning I had no time to dodge right. It pivoted toward me again, building its momentum before launching. I waited longer this time to see what it would do, waiting for the timing to step into place. Now! I dodged to the left just barely, bringing my sword in for a slash as if I were about to hit a home run. There was a loud clunk as my blade collided with the chin and, arm, with the chin and hard. Before it was deflected, the monster was thrown off its initial course and rolled away to a stop. There, That was a no for hitting it normally then. It had to have a weak spot somewhere, but the question was where. Yeah. I could only take so many more hits before my endurance was up, and the, th and the throb in my broken finger wasn't helping. The fade had started moving again, building up speed as I took a moment to think. If this thing was like a pill bug, then this was essentially its defensive mode. It had to be able to unfurl itself somehow, and maybe I could learn more that way. The Weevil. <gasps> I love that name. The Weevil bolted towards me, seeming to aim for the side and do another attack from behind. I went to dodge, but it changed the direction of its body at the last minute, hurtling toward me. I managed to bring my sword up to block direct impact to my body, but out a cry of pain as the pressure on my broken finger built and I was knocked flat onto the ground, sword falling from my hands. Before I could react, the monster was on me in an instant. It launched upwards again, but then unfurled with a dramatic screech. Time seemed to stop as it hung above me, suspended in midair. Excuse me. I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but excuse me. 
Underneath the exterior shell was a pale-skinned underbelly. The length of it encompassed the entirety of my body. Its stubby legs resembled that of hands and planted themselves on my sides, giving me little room to move from the weight of its heavy body on mine. I looked down the underbelly, seeing pale, pupilless eyes staring back at me with a long appendage full of glistening teeth snaking downwards. The weevil pressed down on me, the mouth attaching to my torso and biting into my flesh. I cried out in pain as I felt the warmth of my blood leaking out of my body as it chewed into my stomach. On instinct, I swung my head upwards as I cried, my forehead colliding with the fleshy underside. The fate had released from me and curled up as it tried to flee. I knew its weakness now, but it had cost me a good amount of blood. I grabbed the sword and used it to help myself up, trying to think of how to get it to open itself up again so I could stab it properly. It charged again, and I dodged. Interrupting my train of thought, the weevil seemed to be moving faster, as though it were desperate to win now. The speed of attacks began to quicken, leaving me with little to no time to think. I didn't know how to get it to open up again, and my stamina was decreasing rapidly with my open wound. As I went for my next dodge, I wasn't able to move fast enough. Its body collided with my shoulder, and I let out a screech of pain, my arm falling limply to my side as it had been dislocated from the trauma. The sword fell from my grasp as my hand went numb from the shock. I spun to watch the creature with gritted teeth. I was running out of time. I had to get desperate. An idea came to me, one that would more than likely get me killed. But the rage and adrenaline from it convinced me that I had to try no matter what. As a monster shot towards me again, I quickly dodged to the side. It still clipped me, however, and I was sent sprawling face first down into the ground. My dad is playing music right now. I was glad for the numbness in my arm, dulling the pain momentarily, but resented the sand in my open stomach wound. My dominant arm lay beneath me and ready. From the corner of my eye, I saw it spread out once more, leaping up into the cloudless sky above me to pounce on my broken, bleeding form. I pushed my arm off to turn over, pointing the sword up from where I lay on it in one motion, using all my strength to send out a final thrust. The weevil impaled itself onto my blade, shrieking in pain as its, as its black blood trickled down the metal. I used it as leverage to get back onto my feet, pinning it to the ground with one hand and, as it squirmed. I dragged the blade upward as it let out a dying scream, signifying my victory in the fight. I did it! I won! And yet still, anger burn burned inside me. I wasn't done with it yet. I nearly collapsed as I watched Xavier de deliver the killing blow. <laughs> I'd barely breathed the whole fight from the sheer anxiety of it all. The hands on my two new companions helped keep me upright as I took a second to relax. He did it! He really did it! I looked at his face, trying to see the same sense of triumph out that I was feeling at that moment, except it was nowhere to be found. The crowd loudly cheered to Xavier's deaf ears as he stared at the corpse, one arm hanging limply by his side. I could see what emotion displayed itself plainly on his face. Rage. He raised his sword again, the crowds cheering louder, believing he was doing it for them, and causing Alistair to step forward with his booming voice. Everyone, we have another glorious victor! Give it up for the... His voice trailed off as Xavier brought the sword down finally, cutting into its flesh and spraying him with blackened blood. And then he swung again. And again. And again! And again! Ooh, he's pissed! The bat hacked at the weevil until it was nothing more than a pile of minced meat, coating Xavier in a, vicious in a viscous layer of blackened blood. The crowd had stopped cheering, falling silent and stunned at the sheer violence that had occurred. Everyone was uncomfortably quiet. Xavier dropped the blade to the sand, falling to his knees and breathing heavily. I never thought he had something like that in him, but I guess we all reach a breaking point. This was his. He let his emotions take control, and that faded was the victim of his built-up anger at everything. A as I said! Alistair cleared his throat. His voice cracking with the initial delivery. Give it up for Xavier, the barbarian bat! I wasn't sure why I'd expected the crowd to react in the same manner as Alistair had, shocked and uncomfortable, when instead they exploded into deafening cheers of delight at the violence presented to them. They'd all come to experience the show of a lifetime, and here it was given in graphic detail. This was the violence they'd craved, and Xavier had delivered it tenfold. 
The guards moved to the field again, bringing out the weapon rack and clearing out the body while they began to drag Xavier back. Alistair should have been narrating this part, continuing the show, but the final look towards the line, he seemed to be shaken by the whole thing. Maybe there was a bit of his old conscience left after all. I ducked back down, motioning for Treat and Shen to bring me back to our secluded corner we'd been in before I took a seat on the bench. Go get Xavier, please. Without protest, the two went off to fetch the bat as I took a breather from it all. It had not even been a full 24 hours since I'd been reunited with Alistair, and I still felt overwhelmed by it all. With the insanity of Wonderland thrown into the mix, I was just glad my part in it was over. Xavier and I had lived to see another day, despite both of us being worse for wear. That's a simple fact I could at least focus on. Anything more than that at the moment was a bit too much for me. It didn't help that I was starting to think that the double head trauma I'd just received had given me a concussion. Eventually, eventually the three limped back to our corner, towels in hand ready to wipe off a majority of the faded's blood. I didn't even want to think about where the filthy cloth had come from. The crowd parted without a word from them, the display they just witnessed only serving to provide more fear to our little party. Shen and Treat lowered Xavier onto the bench, the latter cringing a little as the pressure was applied to his abdominal wound in the process. I wanted to rush over to fuss over him, to try and treat his wounds, but I felt helpless without any of the supplies I usually had with me. I was almost panicking on what to do. Luckily, Treat stepped in instead. He immediately began assessing Xavier instead. Aside from the broken finger that's, that's already been treated, there's a matter of a stomach wound and shoulder. Hang on. Yeah, he didn't add that. Uh, no. I didn't. Thankfully, the wound isn't deep, but I don't have anything sanitary to treat it with at the moment. Let me check the preferences. Eh. The shoulder, however, is simply dislocated. I can pop it back into place, but it'll hurt. Shen, can you find something for him to bite down on? I expected a tease from the hyena, but instead they set to the task immediately. How do you know how to pop it back in? Are you some kind of doctor? Treat laughed at that. The two of you really do have similar thoughts. Oh, okay. Well, I was captain of my rugby team, so I took it upon myself to learn some basics of first aid and treatment of typical sports injuries. Now I've dislocated my own shoulder once or twice on the field. I placed my hand on Xavier's other shoulder and smiled at Treat, giving him a nod of approval. Don't worry, kid. You're in good hands. Treat returned my smile, appreciative of the trust I was showing him in this moment. I hadn't expected to find allies so fast, but they were exactly what I needed to help get us out of here. It felt natural to trust all three of my new friends. The moment was broken suddenly as voices called out from elsewhere in the room. Hey, give that back! <gasps> Soon, handsome! I need it right now. But it's my lucky stick! They snorted. <laughs> Who the fuck has a lucky stick? I do! <laughs> well, if it's so lucky, then it'll come right back to you. <laughs> Can Shen please join our party as we make our way to ha as we make our way to what I think is called Haven? I don't know, it's been a while. There wasn't a response as Shen made their way back to our group carrying the apparently lucky stick. A branch that was found who knows where or when. A one bite down stick delivered fresh in 30 minutes or less. Treat took his shook his head with a smile as he gave Xavier the stick stick to bite down on. Alright, you'll feel some sudden pain and be sore for a bit after. Xavier gave a laugh before flinching. Pretty sure I'll be sore elsewhere regardless. A fair point. Now, I'll pop it back in on the count of three. Ready? Burn the lucky st- <laughs> Xavier placed the stick in his mouth and nodded. Three- not wasting a second, he immediately pushed Xavier's shoulder up and back into place, causing the bat to bite down hard onto the stick and make a muffled noise of pain. Sorry! If I counted down, the anxiety would have built up, and it's often better just skip it entirely. You okay? Xavier rolled his shoulder gently, testing it before he used the arm to take a, the stick out of his mouth. The soreness you mentioned is definitely there, but I can move it again, so I'd say that's a good sign. The Wolverine went to give the bat a hearty pat on the back, but stopped himself after thinking about it. Great! So now that you two boys have been cleared by the school nurse, how about we get to answering some questions? Particularly you, Dorian. How'd you end up dating a monster like that? I'm also curious. You said before they separated us while I was waiting to fight, so I was stuck thinking about it. 
I felt a little ganged up on having all three of them questioning me on what was a very traumatic experience and a bit difficult for me to discuss. Aww. Aw, oh, but Xavier's smiling, so naturally I have to answer. I shifted nervously, unsure of what to say. Before I knew it, Xavier slid his hand onto mine subtly on the bench, and I felt myself comforted a bit in that moment. He was always looking out for me. He deserved to hear the truth. Well, I'll start things out from the beginning, back when he and I had first met. Oh? Oh? Several years ago... Do I need to censor soon? And I'm just like, I'm just like cracking my back. Seriously, do I need to censor soon? Because I don't think Twitch will appreciate having a weenie doodle on screen. While most people my age had gone away for college, a career set in their minds with their hearts ready to give it their all. I had opted out of education for the time being. Okay. The fact was, I didn't know what I wanted. Nothing had ever truly stuck out to me. Life had failed to inspire me to become something, and nothing set me on that path for life. I was 19 and completely lost. Most of the friends I'd had in high school had moved away to follow those dreams that I'd lacked, leaving me behind with my minimal social skills to fend for myself. Those few that were left were too busy with their own education, leaving me to feel like the runt of the litter. As such... No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't help but feel like there was something wrong with me for being so different. Instead, I turned to work. All I could grab with my high school diploma were minimum wage jobs, which I told myself would be valid work experience in the... in the future. Hang on. Yeah, it is very considerate. So, after graduation, I turned to the workforce and saved while living with my parents. It cut my expenses down significantly, but resulted in cutting down my mental health as well. I was feeling like a burden. After a while, I tried to look for an apartment on my own, but living in the city was damn expensive. My only choice was to look for a roommate. It was luck that I managed to find the perfect place on my first try. My own bedroom, low rent, and a guy a few years older than me in need of someone to fill that spot. I sent in my application and it was almost immediately accepted. Not long after, I packed my things and moved in. I was nervous, rooming with a stranger. My social anxiety wasn't a help in these kinds of situations, but over time I warmed up to him. His name was Will. He was a fox, tall and slender with some muscle to him. Quite the ladies' man, considering the amount of women he dated in the time we lived together. He was quite accepting of the fact that I was gay. I started living with what felt like a fresh start with a new friend. It didn't quell all the voices that shouted in my head, but it helped quiet them a bit. Look, I hate to interrupt a good story. Good. Ow! But can we get to the part about Alistair, please? Right, sorry. Pfft. Will was tired of seeing how lonely I was and kept insisting I try to find a boyfriend to help with it. He tried to set me up a few times, but I was always reluctant. Eventually, he decided to invite me to a bar with a couple of his buddies, one of whom worked there. I accepted, and upon arrival was when I met him. Alistair. I wasn't sure what drew me to him out of all of Will's friends, but there was a charm I couldn't ignore. He seemed to have that same charisma as Will, but amplified to the point where you couldn't take your eyes off him. I guess that's what, I'm gotten, that's what got him started as a bartender, that magnetic pull. The owner clearly knew the line would be great for business. While we were there, I watched how he interacted with everyone. The line was friendly, social, and polite. But his attitude towards me was something else, something different. He drew out a part of me I never knew existed. We talked more and more as the night wore on, I could, I, and I could tell he felt the pull towards me just as I felt it towards him. Sparks were flying and all of our friends around us knew it. We were so engrossed in conversation we hadn't noticed our friends leave, only drawn back to reality when an alarm went off signaling the end of his, when an alarm on his phone went off signaling the end of his shift. We suggested we take the conversation back to his place. He suggested we take the conversation back to his place, and I happily obliged. I'm just making sure that there's no NSFW sprites. I'm, I'm just making sure. 
No, no, not tennis ace. I know, I'm just as shocked. How did I accidentally open up tennis ace instead of, you know, one last night? And to that, I don't know. Yeah, I know the, about the CG. I know about that. Alright, we're good. He asked me out a week later and I instantly said yes. From there, our relationship took flight. We fell for each other hard, becoming practically inseparable. We spent most of our free time together and constantly visited each other at work. It was something completely unfamiliar to me, that level of dedication. It all felt like a dream, yet also like I was waking up and seeing the world for the first time. Our relationship changed me on a fundamental level. Yeah, that's because of an error. I was an introvert and he was an extrovert, but our time together brought out parts of me I didn't know I had hidden. He taught me that though the world was cruel, I shouldn't be afraid of it. I learned how to act confident by being myself, to socialize, even to love and be loved in that way. My whole perspective was changed by Alistair, which is why it's so shocking to see him the way he is now. Back then, he was caring, kind, affectionate, and sweet. He stuck his neck out for anybody and everybody and was more than willing to go out of his way if it meant he could help someone. He did volunteer work at the orphanage he was raised at, as well as donated money to them on a monthly basis. He took me on a few dates where we helped out at a soup kitchen. It wasn't quite what I'd expected, but any time spent with him was time I enjoyed. He also treated me like a king when we started out. and He spoiled me with gifts and quality time and so much affection, I could tell he was truly a kind soul. After a year we moved in together, we were confident that things with between us could last forever. Then it all changed. A few months after my birthday and after dating for barely over a year and a half, I got a phone call from emergency services. They'd found my parents dead in a car wreck. It was a horrible accident and there were no survivors from either party. I was devastated. I turned to Alistair to comfort me, to be my rock. He was, for a little while, but eventually things seemed to change. It was as though he was more preoccupied, working more often and spending less and less time with me despite living together. His comfort words were repetitive and hollow, as though we'd lost interest. Slowly but surely, a gap began to grow between us. I no longer knew what to do. That same hollow feeling of loneliness that I hadn't felt since before we'd met had begun creeping back into my life, and it scared me. I didn't know how to approach him about it. As the days ticked closer and closer to our two-year anniversary, everything seemed to go to shit. I'd been out all day with Will, who had patiently listened to my worries, made efforts to cheer me up when I arrived back at our place. It was late, and I'd avoided announcing myself, not wanting to risk waking Alistair if he'd been asleep. I was tired myself and knew that he always gave the best cuddles when sleepy. It was something I could use at the moment. I'm just going to go ahead and pull up the sensor. Yeah, I'm just going to censor the whole fucking window. I took off my shoes and wandered to the kitchen for a glass of water when I heard it. The sounds coming from the bedroom. Not wanting to think the worst, I assumed that maybe he was watching porn, or our sex life hadn't been great recently and it made sense if he was trying to get himself off. I walked closer and closer to the door, trying to convince myself that everything was fine. My hands hovered above the knob, twitching from the building anxiety as I tried to gather the courage. Oh, there it is. The sensor. I took one final deep breath and pushed the door open to find exactly what I wish I hadn't. There, bending over another man, was Alistair. They were parallel to the door so I could see both of them in full view as they fucked. Both had frozen as I'd opened the door and they stared at me in shocked surprise. I think Alistair must have called out to me at that moment, but my ears were dead to the world as I fled, my heart racing. I couldn't believe the sight before me. I couldn't help but wonder what I could have done better, where I'd gone wrong. What had led things to the point where he'd cheat on me? All these thoughts echoed through my head as I fled into the night. The image burned behind my eyes, Alistair, naked with a man whose face I'd never forget. The one and only palace's cat I've ever met, who stands up there now next to his master. The next day, I returned to find Alistair waiting there for me. I'd wandered the city all night before finally returning back to my ruined home. 
I screamed at Alistair, asking him how he could do this and why. I was pissed and hurt and full of negative emotions that I couldn't keep in anymore. If he had talked to me, I would have been fine opening up our relationship. I understand that sometimes you can't always fill a partner's needs completely. But the deceit, going behind my back to do it, that was a complete breach of trust I couldn't forgive. By the time I'd finished saying my piece, tears wetting my cheeks, I finally looked at him again properly and his expression told me everything I needed to know. He looked indifferent, as though nothing I'd said meant, had meant a thing to him, as though the p near, past nearly two years of our lives were all for nothing. That look was no more was more than I could handle. I walked away, grabbing what shit of mine I could quickly find, packing it up, and calling Will in desperation. He was immediately sympathetic and let me stay for a little while, and as I left that apartment, the place I thought could have been my true home with the man I thought was my forever, I saw that look again on his face. That was the last time I ever saw Alistair. Until now. There was a silence amongst us as I finished up the story. Nobody quite sure how to respond to the situation. I just laid two major events for my life bare for the three of them to do with as they pleased, with the majority of one having to do with the person who was holding all of us captive. Frankly, both things were trauma I hadn't wanted to relive, but were necessary in order for them to have a better un better picture and understanding our captor. I couldn't help myself worrying over what they would say, though. I knew I wasn't in the wrong for what happened, yet a part of me felt like I was even after all this time. He was and will always be my first love. Someone who set my life on a new path I'm not sure I ever would have ventured on if I had never met him. He changed a lot of me for the better when we were together. I said I hated the lion, that I absolutely despised him for everything that transpired, which was mostly true, but I knew that a piece of my heart still belonged to him. And that part is what, re what regretted not having heard him out most of all. There were still so many unanswered questions I had about everything, but I couldn't waste my time thinking about those right now. I brought my focus back to my three companions, the silence stretching further on until Shen fi eventually broke it. Well, shit. It wasn't the most elegant response, but one I'd take nonetheless. The other two seemed to relax on not having to be still and silent anymore thanks to the hyena. Almost immediately, I found myself wrapped in a double hug from both Xavier and Treat in an attempt f for them to show their support for me in the scenario. I graciously accepted it and hugged them back, enjoying the affection. I realized now that a few stray tears had fallen down my face during this story that I took a second to wipe away. When the hug ended, me having to tap on Treat's shoulder to prevent him from squeezing us and our injuries too hard, there was still an awkward energy floating around the group. None of us knew what to say next. Hmm. Shen seemed to be contemplating something as they looked me up and down. What is it? They sighed. It's not that I don't believe your story, because I do. There's just one detail that's missing that I need to know. I'm not sure what I'd left out on the table, but if it helps them trust me, I'm more than willing to give it. Ask away. They didn't miss a beat. How big is Alistair's dick? <laughs> I blinked, knowing I should have expected something like this from them, but still being caught off guard nevertheless. Treat immediately stood up and moved to smack Shen in the back of the head. The hyena dodged and began to use Xavier as a barrier as he chased them. <laughs> I could almost hear the cartoon chase music start up. I found myself smiling at the antics. The tension from before dissipated. Somehow they'd known just what to say to get things back on track. Which meant it was my turn to respond and the two could play their game. God damn it! Nine inches. God damn. God damn it! Damn it! Fuck! Fuck! All of them turned to me. What? Shen asked how big he was. That's the answer. Nine inches. Shen whistled. Damn, Dorian. Impressive. Oh, I knew you could take it. I didn't realize just how much you had it in you. God damn it! God damn it! God damn it! Ugh. Who says it was just... <laughs> Their eyes widened before a laugh. Alright, I respect it. Game recognize game. 
and he gave an approving nod and I saw Xavier blushing a little. I couldn't help but wink at him when we made eye contact and he blushed harder. I clapped my hands, eager to move on with the conversation now that the barrier of awkwardness has been overcome. Now with that out of the way, I believe there was an agreement the two of you would share more about yourselves. Indeed there was. It's only fair you got to ask whatever, given the significance of what you told us. As I was thinking it over, Xavier spoke up. I have one, if that's alright with you, Dorian. Be my guest. Well, I guess it's not so much a question as more of a general thing to be curious about, but I'd like to hear more about your life before the apocalypse. I think that's a good way to get to know each other better. Shen tensed up at the proposal, Treat giving them a quick glance at the same moment. Now I can start us off with that since we didn't really have proper introductions. Now let's get past the name part since Shen already introduced me. I almost asked about before remembering the earlier warning they'd given. I grew up here in the city, originally living on the east side before moving to the west when I was around eight or so. My childhood wasn't great, but I managed. I lived with my mother, who was an extremely hard-working working woman who gave us her, gave her, gave us, uh, who gave it her all to raise us as best as she could as a single parent. Wasn't an easy task, but she made it work. Then there's my younger sister, Trixie, who's about two years younger and means the whole world to me. Life was difficult for us both growing up, but it strengthened our bond as siblings. I'll do anything for her. Hell, before high school, I'd been working out to make sure I could protect her better, both her and my mom. Since our mom was busy working full-time, we dedicated ourselves to studying so she wouldn't have to worry about us or our future. At a young age, we both had the goal of getting to a place in life where we could support her like she did us. Eventually, when I entered high school, I was in great shape with a studious and healthy mind. Classes were easy for me, and I was ready to learn something new, which is where rugby came into play. I joined our school's team in my second year, and by the third, I was a star player. I had a knack for strategy and a build that was imposing to others my age. During the championship that year, several scouts attended the match in order to seek me out for their universities. When the time came for my final year, I didn't even think of where to apply. Didn't even have to think of where to apply. Universities from across the country were hoping to have me go to their schools, all offering full-time scholarships. It was a dream come true for me. The only problem was that they were all so far away. In order to go, I'd have to leave my family behind. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath, letting, out, letting it out in a sigh. I couldn't do that. I wanted to stay and protect them. Eventually, Gallhaven approached me. They'd offered me the same deal so many other places had, and it was a miracle that I got to stay so close to my family. I accepted their offer, took up a course in biochemistry while joining their rugby team, and the rest is history. In sync, Xavier and I gave nods and smiles of approval. It made sense why he'd lasted through the previous Wonderland now. He was strong, kind-hearted, and a protector. That combined with his intellect made him a more than worthy ally and commanded a lot of my respect. A voice whispered in the back of my mind, though, having listened carefully to his words. He talked about his sister in the present tense, but his mother's in the past. Something had happened there. Instead of dragging the conversation down with what would no doubt be a difficult topic, I turned my attention to Shen instead. What about you? What about me? They had grown quiet and tense during Treat's recount, for reasons I wasn't sure why. Well, what's your story? They looked like they were about to snap, but Treat put a hand on their shoulder and they took a deep breath. Pointing our eyes, they spoke. There's nothing to tell, really. Average life. I realized I was non-binary, came out, was accepted by most. That's it. Never went to college and instead lived with the roommate straight out of high school. I waited for anything more of an explanation, but none came. It's clear their past was something they weren't comfortable talking about. I wanted to try and ask more to convince them to open up, but when Treat shot a quick glance towards Xavier and I and shook his head, though, I could tell that was all we'd get for now. I'll go next, then, if that's all right. Turning, I looked at him in surprise. Are you sure? He gave me an understanding nod and whispered to me. It might make Shen more willing to open up if I do. They might be able to sim empathize. Bye. I smiled, happy that his kind-heartedness remained at the forefront of his mind. Oh. I listened with the others as he gave them the same story he told me on our journey, only interrupting a few times when he started to go on a tangent, tangent over one of his passions. Then I found Dorian and he told me about what happened to the world and now we're here. Treat and Shen wore the same look of sympathy as I had when he'd first told me. It wasn't exactly the happiest of backgrounds, but Xavier told it all with a smile. Treat leaned forward and rustled the bat's head fur. You're a brave guy, Xavier. There's a few things I have questions about, but I'll leave most of those for later. What I really want to know is how old you are. I'm turning 22. 20, turning 20, Turning 23 this year. Hey, same as me then. Wow, really? But you're so built! 
a decade of working out will do that to you, bud. If you're looking to help build m more muscle, I can give you some tips. As the two began to talk about improving their bodies, Shen and I shook our heads and mumbled simultaneously. Youngins. We made eye contact and appraised each other. 25 going on 26. 24 as of this year. The age difference was smaller, but the years I could see behind their eyes gave me a respect that they had aged beyond their physicality. Just what was their story? A question popped into my head to ask the group that might just help me learn more about the hyena. Alright, I've got something for everyone to answer. They all looked at me expectantly. What's your motivation? Things are tough in this world right now, especially with us being kidnapped, but none of us having given up yet. For me, I want to find my boyfriend and the love of my life, Marshall. I finished speaking and a feeling welled up in my chest. My quest to find Marshall is what I've dedicated myself to, but I began to realize that it's no longer the only thing keeping me going anymore. After leaving Haven to search for him, I think I was also trying to look for more purpose. I wanted to help people like so many had risked their necks to help me. Like how Marshall reached out when we first met. Though I didn't say it out loud, I thought to myself the other motivation I've developed in that period. I want to protect Xavier. I'm not sure I really have a solid one yet, but I think the thing that I want the answer to most is what happened to my parents. They weren't the greatest at times, but they're still two of the people I love most. I smiled at the bat, taking my turn to rustle his head for as he let out a few delighted bat noises from it. I want to find my sister. We got separated a while ago, and I made some mistakes that led to, well, this. He gestured to everything around us. I need to know that she's okay. Seems like all of us are looking for loved ones, then. Guess so. What about you, Shen? What keeps you going? They laughed. Easy. It's spite. Spite? Yep. This world is a shit show, and what better for me to tell it fuck you than to keep living and moving forward despite that? I live my life as one big middle finger to existence. I felt that. I felt that on a molecular level. I fucking felt that. It was a different response than what I was expecting, but completely on brand for them. If it helped them move forward, then I wasn't going to judge. I can respect that. Same here. It's a good rule to live by. It's very freeing. Helps me justify quite a few questionable actions. Like what? Sleeping with our captors, for one. Now, I haven't questioned that once. Hate fucking in it is an invigorating feeling. I'm afraid to know what you do, question. Oh, just the usual. Existence, stealing candy from babies, trees. <laughs> trees? Yeah, trees. Why do you question trees? Because you can never trust a tree. Those things are evil. Trees are evil to you? I don't get why this is so hard to understand. What has a tree ever done for you? Plenty of kids each year get injured climbing them. If one falls, it can destroy a house, not to mention if it falls in the woods. We can't be sure if it makes a sound. All of us were speechless at this. I couldn't think of a single way to argue against such an out-there statement. Speaking of those traitors, where'd that raccoon go? I need to give him back his stick that imb that's imbued with the power of superstition. <laughs> <laughs> we looked around the room trying to find the reluctant helper, but unable to identify him amongst the small crowd. Uh, guys, I found him. We turned to the bat who pointed out the window. Where we all saw the raccoon being wrapped up by a spider like faded, looking away before a sickening crunch sounded in the crowd cheered. It was a grim reminder of our current circumstances. We backed away from the window and exchanged glances, Shen pocketing the stick with a sigh. None of us wanted to be here. Almost like our thoughts were being read, there was a commotion by the entrance we'd all seen. We'd all been brought in th through as the other guards are pre prepared to send in the next contestant. Will you just go and get them already? I'm only following orders. I paused, listening to the voice. It was a woman speaking, and she sounded familiar. And you expect me to believe you can handle it alone? It's two injured people compared to one healthy person. I can handle it. I don't know. Still a variable. I can prove to you just how capable I can be against two opponents. You and your buddy there already look like you got your shit rocked. I'd say that'd be even who to who I'm escorting. Dude, just let her go. But... I'm not getting punched again. The first bandit let out a sigh. Fine. He cleared his throat before calling out to the crowd, not even bothering to look for whoever he needed. Dorian and Xavier, your escort to see the nurses here. I blinked, surprised that we were actually being taken to be treated properly. I'd figured we'd have to wait until the end of Wonderland to be able to see her. 
Xavier beamed and slowly stood up, clearly excited to be getting out of here, but still cautious of his wounds. I followed suit and looked at her two new friends. If I could get a word off, Treat pulled the two of us into a hug. We'll see you guys later, alright? Make sure to rest up and you'll be back to peak condition in no time. Thanks, if we're not back in time to see your fights, then just know we're rooting for you. The Wolverine gave a laugh. No need to worry about that. Wonderland is going to be lasting three days this time. You two already made a splash today, so they'll probably spread its returning contenders out to keep it interesting. The thoughts of having to sit through two more days like today sounded like actual hell. As we turned to leave, we raised our arms to wave as they did the same and caused Treat's shirt to raise up and expose for some of his midriff. If my eyes hadn't drifted there, I doubt I would have noticed that there was a small but noticeable mark on the left side of his torso. A burn scar. My mind began to spin as we turned and walked to where our escort was waiting, but the sight of her distracted me and immediately before I could give it much thought. There's like a dog. Hey. Hey. Go lay down. Standing at the entrance was a tall but muscular woman, a bandana covering her muzzle. She was a German shepherd, as evidenced by her color scheme and other canine features. She wore an aqua blue sleeveless shirt, showing off the definition in her arms and the dragonfly tattoo that curled its way up her right bicep. To match, she wore black jeans and a belt while a dangling golden blue earring hung from each ear. I tripped over my own feet trying to keep myself stable as we approached her. What was she doing here? She laughed at my stumble and then turned to the guards. See what I mean? Hardly a threat. She reached a hand to his cheek and patted him a few times. Now how about you be a good boy and bind their arms as an apology for the hassle you just put me through for a simple request, hmm? You two wouldn't want Alistair to find out you disobeyed him now, would you? The bandit grumbled to himself as he bound our hands in front of us, handing the leads to our escort. Perfect, that'll be all, sweetheart. With that, she turned and led us out of the room towards our destination. Oh? Oh? just get more comfortable there we go we walked we walked in silence as we were led through the passage that had brought us here and back to another building only to be led into another secret passage in that lower level i wasn't sure where it led but that wasn't the biggest thing on my mind right now i continued to play quiet and follow until there was a time we could talk without the risk of being overheard we were brought out of the tunnel into another storage building confirming my earlier theory of there being more than just one building she nodded to the other bandits as we passed taking us up a floor to where more of the office-like rooms were located. There were very few others here. Most of it, most had taken off to watch or help out with Wonderland. The bandit leading us stopped, listening intently and glancing in both directions. Quickly and without warning, she ushered us into a room and closed the door with a loud sigh. Oh? <laughs> Fucking hell, that was stressful! I'm impressed with myself that I managed to get it this far, but this was an entire step up. Go on, you can now applaud me. Xavier was looking at her utterly confused while all I could do was stare in shock. Holy shit, it really is you! In the flesh, D, bring it in! The German Shepherd wrapped me in a tight hug, tried to return it, but was unable to to the bindings. Let out a grunt of pain as she squeezed my untended injuries with all of her strength. Quickly, the canine drew back. Right, sorry, sorry, I got carried away with the moment there. Let me take care of those. She started to remove our restraints, prompting Xavier to speak up. Dorian, why do you seem to know so many of these bandits? Is there something you're not telling me? That This real laugh from her. I like this twink already. He and Olivier would get along so, so well, I think. Aside from the questionable fashion choices, that is. You really know how to find them, D. Xavier muttered something under his breath. Why does everyone keep calling me a twink today? Because you're a twink. I watched as the gears in his head clicked into place with a start. Wait, are you from Haven? She beamed at him. Lowering the bandana from her muzzle. Smart, too. He got it with next to no context. The name's Thee, Bat Boy. Thee extended a hand. Is it Thea? Wait, is it Thee or Thea? Thea. Okay. Thea extended a hand, gripping Xavier's hard as she gave it a firm shake. Xavier. A strong name. I like it. No wonder you did so well in your fight. The brutality at the end was a bit overkill, but admittedly, I do the same in your shoes. Thea. 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 
They stepped. I stepped forward, bringing the shepherd's attention back to me. Look, Thea, I'm ecstatic to see you here. Probably more than you know, but I don't understand. Why are you here? How are you here? They stared at me, her face mirroring the confusion I'd been feeling since I first saw her here. You mean Rhea didn't tell you? Tell me what? She rubbed her forehead, seeming to gather her thoughts. God damn it, Rhea, you owe me for this. She took a deep breath. A few months ago, Rhea approached me and asked for my help. They'd learned about the existence of a Sabanic root and her group and heard whispers of what they were up to. They were concerned about what was going on, and after some discussion, they thought the best way to stay safe and learn more was to put a man on the inside. Or in this case, a woman. She put on a satisfied smirk at that. She knew they could trust me to get the job done, and as such, I figured, hey, what's one more burn scar anyway? And accepted the offer. She told me it was a secret mission, one that I couldn't tell anyone so naturally. I told Olivia the second she left. He didn't want me to go, but knew that I was more than capable for the job. After a makeover to help me look the part, about two weeks later, I left on my mission and infiltrated what we now know is called the Ignited. Kind of tacky name, if you ask me. Alright, while the sad plays, I'm going to go get a drink. I will be back. Ah. Oh, shit. And I'm back. Kind of. I'm just getting a drink. Alrighty. <sighs> Honestly, I probably won't join the voice call. I'll edit last night's VOD. And by edit, I of course mean... And of course, by edit, I mean, I'm just going to shorten it and then I'll upload it and then I'm probably going to call my friend and go to bed. Probably going to call a friend, talk to her for a bit, and then go to bed. I was reeling over this new info. I'm sorry, but like, I kind of want sleep. Could make her to help me look the part about two weeks. Yeah, I already read that. I was reeling over this new info, questioning why Rhea had hidden something so big from me. I also explained why I hadn't been able to say goodbye to her by the time I left Haven. She was already spying here for them. After I'd built up enough trust, I was able to get messages out by going on night patrols and leaving notes at a designated location. In exchange, they left some for me as well. So I couldn't have... So I couldn't have been there when you left, by the way. You'll have to tell me all about what happened while you were away. But anyway, as more people were kidnapped, I learned just what Wonderland was. And how close they were to running another one. Uh, mm, 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 mm. I'm not going to respond to that. I am not going to respond to that. I sent an emergency message to Haven and hadn't heard back since. Then, you two arrived. The pieces all began to fall into place. The messenger from Haven hadn't been sent with news of Marshall, but to warn me of the bandit group led by my ex. Haven was on lockdown because it couldn't risk more people being kidnapped, and we were kidnapped in order to start Wonderland. Eh, don't worry about it. It had all been a series of unfortunate coincidences, Thea continued. I was planning to leave at the start of this, of this edition with either that Wolverine hunk or my fellow trans hyena, but now that you two are here, I can take one of you instead. The two of us were silent for a moment before Xavier spoke what we were both thinking. Only one of us? She sighed. More than that poses a big risk. This wouldn't be the first case of an escape attempt. It'd mean I'd be locked up like you two if we fail and leave Haven down. Not to brag or anything, but an important part of its leadership. She turned to look at me, which is why I'd like to extend the opportunity to take you with me, Dorian. I blanched. Wait, what? With your help, there's no doubt we could organize an assault on this place. If we do enough damage to their inventory, rescue their prisoners, maybe fuck with some of the line's dickheads' personal supplies, it could cause an internal conflict. It might just be enough to get them to disband, even. So, what do you say? 
I barely even thought about it before the word left my mouth. No! No? I shook my head, catching Xavier's surprised reaction in the corner of my eye. As much as I'd like to do that, Thea, I can't. My conscience wouldn't allow me to accept w getting out while others are trapped here. The duo stared at me, likely confused as to why I wasn't taking the opportunity to escape. Isn't this what I had wanted? A chance to get out and continue searching for Marshall? Yeah, trans rights. Which is why you need to take Xavier instead. Whoa, hold on. Why me? I don't even know anybody from Haven. Your connections there would be much more influential and you'd accomplish a lot more. Because I know what you've been through and I know the last thing you want is to be trapped again. The bat shifted uncomfortably. Our whole kidnapping was never supposed to happen. You deserve the chance to be able to live a life not trapped in one place. You've had your share of burdens recently, Xavier. Allow me to give you this break, please. He was silent for a moment, before wiping a tear and smiling at me. Thanks, Dorian. The bat then threw himself into a tight hug around me. Anytime, kid. We stood there in our embrace for a short while until Thea cleared her throat. Ending the moment, I couldn't help but feel a heat rise to my cheeks. Thea eyed me suspiciously before continuing. Well then, Xavier, looks like you'll be getting to see Olivier sooner than I thought. God, how I miss his wit right now. I'm sure he misses you all the same. Did your lovely twin give you some acting tips before you left? Because you were quite convincing. Nope, that was all me. That was all me, D. It's easy to blend in when nobody is willing to challenge you. She flexed. Guns of steel and a boisterous personality can take you a long way, boys. Keep working towards it. Maybe someday you too can be like me. A sassy blacksmith? Damn right. I know, I know that without this apocalypse, I would have been the next worldwide icon little girls dreamed about. I, I smiled mischievously. Or had nightmares about. She glared. Careful, Dorian. I can still bench press your ass up and over the side of this building. Over the side of a building. Ah. I raised my hands in defense, causing her to smile. As much as I'd love to catch up more, we need to get you two to N Nadia's office. If we waste any more time, they'll know something is up. Thea grabbed the rope and gestured to put our hands up so she could rebind them. Since I'm going to be taking the bat here with me, though, I'd appreciate it if you could give us some help, Dorian. What do you mean? Even though Wonderland will be over and the bandits will be partying to celebrate, it would help if you could get distractions going. The less guards roaming the halls, the better. If you can manage a way to distract Alistair too, that would be perfect. He's their boss for a reason, and that reason being he packs some serious firepower. I nodded, my curiosity peaking on what the lion had that could tame so many people. Thea turned her gaze to Xavier. Lastly, find a way to get yourself to the nurse's office for that final night. It's the easiest point of extraction for me to get the both of us out of here. You both got it all that? Loud and clear. Excellent. She placed an ear to the door, listening for a few moments before pulling the bandana back over her muzzle. All right, you two. Back to being miserable. It's time to take action. With that, our spy flung the door open and brought us back out into the hallway and towards our destination. It wasn't much further of a walk from where Thea had taken us aside to be able to reach the nurse's office. It was an average-sized room with proper beds. Fuck. With proper beds spread out across it. I wasn't sure where they'd managed to find them, but I considered myself lucky they did. The room was empty, save for the person we were looking for tucked into a desk at the back corner of the room. Nadia, I believe Thea called her earlier, was an older cheetah woman, a pair of small glasses sitting at the bridge of her nose. She was thin, almost frail-looking, wearing a dark, thin woolen turtleneck tucked into a pair of plain pant, into a pl tucked into a pair of plain tan slacks. She brought her eyes up to us as we approached. Took you long enough. Thought it was clear patients were to be brought directly to me after their fights. I'm sorry, Nadia. I tried. No, that is Doctor Adebayo to you. I may not have received my doctorate, but I have earned then but I have earned more than but I have more than earned it. Right, apologies, Dr. Adebayo. As I was saying, the other bandits there weren't letting them leave, so I had to take it up with Alistair. She shook her head. Of course they did. Most of you seem to have nothing but half baked ideas of how to make others suffer in those empty heads of yours. Nadia looked down looked back down as Thea sighed, knowing she wasn't going to make any progress with the cheetah. The three of us stood there waiting awkwardly before her gaze returned to us. Well, what are you waiting for? Both of you take a seat. You are no longer needed her, girl. I could see the anger burning in Thea's eyes, ready to spill over. Nudged her with my foot to get her back to composing herself. She glared at me. Before her expression softened, Thea untied our 
Thea untied our leads and walked to the exit, sparing one last glance at us and lowering the bandana to mouth two words. Good luck. I nodded in understanding and then she was gone. Xavier and I sat across from each other for a moment, unsure of what to do as the silence stretched on. After a moment, Nadia stood from behind her desk with a first aid kit in hand, and moved towards us to begin whatever treatment she had planned. Now, which one of you will be first? Her eyes darted to me and then Xavier, stopping with the recognition of the bat. Ah, I see you fought on the first day. Quite unfortunate. Well, can't say my luck has been too great recently, so this was about par for the course. He started to laugh, but cringed in pain from his abdominal wound. Nadia's eyes lit up in concern as she finally noticed it. That decides it. We are treating you first. Remove the shirt so I can make properly look at your wounds. But what about... He will be fine. He's injured too. He will be fine. Dressing an open wound like this is what matters more at the moment. Xavier looked like he wanted to say more, but she shushed him. Talking will only make him wait longer. Be silent. The bat looked at me helplessly, but all I could do was shrug. I'd wanted Xavier treated first anyway, so this was the best outcome. That comment she had made earlier clearly had ground to stand on as she began her treatment. Her hands were quick and efficient. First, she'd taken a bucket with warm water that had been prepared from before we arrived and began gently dabbing at the area around the wound. Once the dried blood from both Xavier and the faded had been cleared, she grabbed a clean cloth and some strong-smelling disinfectant to gingerly apply to the wound. Oh my god, I remember Dead Man Wonderland. I remember that anime. Xavier sucked in a sharp breath and grunted, the sting from the fluid causing him pain. Poor kid. Taking a roll of bandages, she tightly bound his abdomen in the gauze and tied it off, securing it in place with a bobby pin. Done. You were lucky the wound was not deep, otherwise you would have needed stitches and months of bed rest. Do not overdo it or the wound will reopen. Are there any other injuries you sustained I should look at? Well, I had my shoulder dislocated, but a friend of ours popped it back in. Oh? She moved to his shoulder, applying pressure to the area to check it. It is well done. I presume the Wolverine did this? Yep. Ah, that boy knows his stuff. I wanted to make him my assistant, but he would not budge in his own goals. The lion also denied the request. That's too bad. Do things tend to get busy around here? Not really. Only when this damnable tournament rolls around. Otherwise, it is these fools coming to me for minor aches and pains. I have treated children with stronger pain capacities. Nadia smiled to herself. Sometimes I like to tell them absurd things they must do in order to feel better, send them on fetch quests. They never even question it due to my accent. That is how I know they are all nothing but idiots. Xavier returned the smile and shot me a wink. He really did have a natural charm in dealing with people. Either way, I'm glad you're here to help people like us. How'd you end up here anyway? Her face darkened and she shifted her attention to Xavier's hand. Raising it, she began to undo the bandaging in order to rebind it. I was tricked by someone I'd known long ago. He wanted my help, and I thought it would be for a good cause, but I was wrong. I'm nothing more than a prisoner like you now, just with a little more freedom. As she finished with Xavier's hand, she held onto it for a moment, gently rubbing the back of it with her thumb. You are a kind soul, young bat. Let it guide you and provide hope for those that can no longer feel it. Be the light for those in the dark. Xavier nodded, a sullen look on his face. I can try. And she reached up and patted his cheek, a soft smile lingering with sadness in her eyes. And that shall be good enough. She drew her hands away from him and brought her attention properly to me. That look of neutrality back on her face. Your turn. What injuries did you sustain? I was hit in my right thigh, left wrist, and on my back by these flesh-eating blob monstrosities. Well, it slashed across the forehead by some claws on my right side. Then I was thrown violently against the wall backwards and bludgeoned in the back of the head by one of the guards. Why did they bludgeon you? Xavier chimed in. He wanted to fight in my place. She shook her head. I will treat you. But if you continue to have a disregard for your own life, you will not receive the same aid. I understand. Good. Now remove your clothes so that I can get started. Oh? Oh, hiya. And thank you. Just. Uh, yep. Yeah, hiya. And welcome. <coughs> A few hours later, I laid back in one of the makeshift hospital beds and stared up at the ceiling. 
Like Xavier, I'd been lucky my wounds weren't deep and hadn't required stitching. The bleeding had stopped amongst all of them and would likely heal quickly. Unfortunately, my head hadn't been so lucky. The trauma from the bandit and wall impact left me to nurse a minor concussion for the next week or so. A bandit had dropped by some time after to send a report back to Alistair, and Nadia informed them that we would be spending the night here for further observation. He tried to object to that, but she quickly shut him down and sent him on his way. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was actually very helpful, even though I just censored the entire screen. But yeah, it was very helpful, and very appreciated. It was clear by now the first day of Wonderland had finished, but rather than feel any sort of relief on the fact I felt nothing but anxious and sad, nobody else had been brought to the office today, meaning Xavier and I were the only two survivors. Not only that, it left only two days for me to form and coordinate an escape plan for Thea and Xavier. It was a lot to handle. I stared across the room to look at the bat, sleeping soundly in his cot. I'm sure he was glad to not have to sleep alone in a dark space again. Meanwhile, Nadia sat at her desk in the corner reading a small book. I couldn't make out the title, but the cover was worn from reuse. I had a time limit to all this, and I couldn't waste any more. We'd been taken out of here come morning, and that left few chances to try and convince her to help us with our plan. It was now or never, but I should at least try to play things smoothly with her like Xavier had. Maybe she would also warm up to me. So Nadia, what- No. She didn't look up from her book. No? I did not give you the right to address me by my first name. If you are going to talk to me, call me Dr. Adebayo. I cringed internally, chastising myself for slipping up already after remembering that earlier. Right, apologies, Dr. Adebayo. All I was going to ask was what book you were reading. No response. What's it called? She flipped the page. And why do you want to know? I'm sorry? What does it matter to you what book I am reading? There is nothing to be gained from such simple conversation. What about me makes you think I am a woman who cares for vapid and empty pleasantries? I quieted, unsure what to say. I think it is clear to the both of us that there is something on your mind you want to talk about that you have deemed important enough to interrupt my reading. So. She paused, finishing the page she was on and sliding a bookmark in to look me in the eyes. Speak your piece or hold it so I may go back to enjoying what limited free time I have of my own. Well, no time like the present. We need your help with something, a plan that we only need you to play a small role in. It's simple, really. All you need... No. But I didn't even finish what I was saying. Yet my answer remains the same. Can I at least finish? No. Because I already know what you're going to say. And what's that? An edge of frustration was creeping into my voice at her dismissive attitude to my pleas for help. Do not raise your voice at me, boy. You are as easy to read as my book. She dropped it onto her desk to emphas for emphasis with a thump, standing up and walking over to our set. You plan to try and escape this place to take your friend and flee, but it will not work. You are not the first to try, and you will certainly not be the first last to fail. We have someone on the inside, though. The bandit who brought us here earlier. She's been spying for months and can help get at least one person out. She laughs. If she is your spy, then your chances are even lower. Nothing about the girl has been subtle since the day she arrived. She would also not be the first to turn her back on our captors. And what happened to the last one? I believe you already met him. After all, he helped your friend there earlier. My mind flashed to the burn scar I'd seen on Treat's midriff earlier. So he had been one of the bandits and was caught trying to escape, resulting in his imprisonment. But why had he joined in the first place? I couldn't make sense of it. Even still, Thea wouldn't be trying this if she didn't have a plan. At the end of Wonderland, the bands will all be too busy the bandits will all be too busy celebrating to put up a proper guard. How do you know this? Because that's what she told me, and I trust her wholeheartedly. And how does she know this? I assume because she's been learning about them, she's been able to guess what will happen. You are saying these words but you do not hear the problems amongst them. I scoffed in annoyance. What problems? Guess and assume. Neither of these mean that you truly know. You and her are doing nothing but making predictions that will only make things worse. If you want a chance to leave this place, you need certainties. I refuse to help with a plan based on nothing but luck. It's not luck. It's... It is what? There is no stable foundation to your words. If you'd let me explain... There's nothing to explain that you have not already said. I have entertained your foolishness long enough. Damn. Oof. She turned her back to me and the patience I'd been holding on to broke. 
Just fucking listen. No. She whipped back around, leaning down and, pointed a f and pointing a finger in my face. You listen to my words and listen closely. Everything I have heard of you from your actions today and what Xavier told me when he was here yesterday have told me everything I need to know. You are careless and brash, leading the way without giving anything proper thoughts or stopping to considering how to act. You chose to live in the moment with, a little, with little thought of the future. Your urge to escape this place is one we all share, and you still focus on yourself and how this can benefit you. He is getting fucking humbled right now. You cannot go through with this, because this is yet again you throwing your life to the wind. In a perfect world where we all make it out of here, what happens when you and the bat are out together and encounter danger? You'll continue that recklessness and endanger him with yourself. If that time comes, he will throw himself in the way to protect you. That boy admires you and cares for you more than you know. He is compassionate, considerate, caring, and a bright hope for the future we all want to see. But if he puts himself in the way of harm like that, injuring himself from your actions and resulting in what could be his death, he is not the one to blame for caring too much. Your actions affect more than just yourself and you seem to forget that. Should his light go out, your, the future will only grow dimmer. His blood will be on your hands and your hands alone. Act smarter and do better or we will all suffer. With that, she stood back up, looking down at me in distaste. Do you understand? Not able to find my voice, I simply nodded at her words. She took that for her answer and sat back down at her desk, picking up where she left off in her book. She was right. Every word that had left her mouth had hit home, and I knew there was nothing I could do at that moment to change her mind. If we were going to survive this, all of us were to make it out alive. We'd have to exercise the utmost caution. I'd have to do better and think harder than I had been. This wasn't some game where I could simply set a checkpoint to restart at. There were consequences to my actions that could not be undone that I had to weigh properly. I looked back at the sleeping bat, my chest filled with worry over his future. If I could help him bring about that future Nadia had imagined, then that's what I had to do. Tomorrow would be a new day, a day of planning and preparations for what would hopefully be a successful escape. Rather than extinguish the flame for my desire to escape, Nadia's speech had fanned it further. I would give it my all to make guarantees and account for possibilities for what could go wrong, to make sure things weren't left to luck. If I couldn't make enough, then we could call it off until the next best opportunity. I laid back in bed, pulling up the covers and feeling the day's exhaustion begin to settle in. I needed the rest for what was to come. My future was in my hands, and I wasn't going to let it slip away. It wasn't often that I dreamed, but on the few occasions that I did, a faint memory playing behind my closed eyes as I drifted off to sleep was the most I ever really got. The most common thing for me was pure darkness, a simple void I existed in until I woke up the next day. That was how I was used to my nights going. Tonight was different. Oh? As I drifted off to sleep, I found myself in a gray space. The emptiness stretched on forever, seemingly infinite in scale. I stood there, unsure of what was happening until I felt something cold on, at my feet. On instinct, I took a step forward and realized that I was walking in a thin layer of fluid. I looked down at my feet to check and saw firsthand that my body had changed. It wasn't a physical change, I still had the same outline that I knew belonged to me. Rather, it appeared as though I was made of static. I reached my arms up in disbelief, staring at the glitching, constantly shifting texture that was in their place. I moved one to touch the other only to find that I wasn't able to feel anything but the cold liquid on the ground. I wasn't sure where I was or what had occurred, but I couldn't just stand there and wait for something to happen. Instead, I took a step forward, my feet silently making contact with the water below. As I walked, I tried to call out into space, but was unable to use my voice. There was no sound here. A part of me wanted to freak out. There was something eerily calming to me about the entire experience. It was as though I was familiar with being here, yet I couldn't place why. Time seemed to become irrelevant as I strode forward through the nothingness, unsure of how long I'd been walking for. After a while, I heard a noise in the distance. As I approached, the water at my feet seemed to be drawn toward its well. In the floor some meters away was a round black hole that the water was rushing towards. I approached it and tried to peer into it, but nothing was to be seen. The water vanished after curling around the lip. I watched it and waited for any kind of change, but none came. Instead, I, com 
Instead, a command began to build in my head until it was all I could think about. Jump. So I took a step closer and jumped straight down into the hole. It was like I'd been submerged in water, the icy feeling in my feet spreading through my whole body as I floated. The noise from before as well as the hole I jumped through had vanished. Alone, I floated through nothingness, until I felt myself pulled forward at a rapid speed, my body hurtling towards its unknown destination with nothing I could do to stop myself. Then, just as sudden, I stopped. Before me now was a sphere of light, pulsing in the space yet illuminating nothing. My body no longer responded to my efforts to move, the only thing cooperating being my eyes. As I took in the space around the orb, I realized I wasn't alone here. That's creepy! Three other static people floated around the sphere with me. One was short and skinny, one tall and average, and the third was noticeably smaller than the rest. They almost looked child-sized. The four of us hovered around the light, unmoving as a voice sounded within our heads. The story has begun. The tale weaves before your eyes, even as you remain unaware. Everything now remains undecided. The path forward is not set, but shaped and molded by what's to come. The pieces are all in place. The roles set to embrace to enable your destinies. The false hero, the one meant to guide the chosen on their path yet astray from their own. Trust in your experience. The hope, the one creating a course for our hero without realizing and giving them a chance against what is to come. Trust in yourself. The variable, the one whose role is not so defined. They are a piece in play that will change the story in ways that cannot be predicted. What they do could aid or hinder the path of our hero. Trust in your heart. The lost, the one who has let desire overcome them and turn them to a worse fate. So far gone are they, it is unclear whether they will ever find themselves again. There is no trust for you to find. The voice stopped, pausing for a moment before repeating itself. The false hero, trust in your allies. The hope, trust in yourself. The variable, trust in your heart. The lost, there is no trust for you to find. Then it repeated again, and again, and again. After the fifth time, the light gave one final pulse, before seemingly exploded and consumed the space around us. Suddenly, images were flashing before my eyes. Ruined cities, churches, laboratories, empty fields, overgrown buildings. There were too many too fast for me to process any of them, yet a sense of recognition filled me as though I knew some of these places. As the images played, the sheer sensory overload of it all began to overtake me, and though I hadn't been breathing, it it no longer feels like I can. Oh my god, thank you for the follow! Then in an instant, the void returned, and I remained paralyzed with the others before the light. Begin. I took one last look at their shapes as the voices said that, and then my body was sent rocketing back through the darkness and towards myself, back towards consciousness. Damn! I like watching the credits. <laughs> that was one last night. Still not the strong, still not the longest stream. That was so fucking good. I fucking love the one last night updates. I fucking love them. Ah. Anyways, Soul Creek is tomorrow. So, I'm going to mentally prepare for that. Anyways, stay safe, have a good night, and I will see you all tomorrow.